explosions. Um, we've had two uh, unconnected structures that were involved in the fire, as well as a, a wildfire that started behind us that we're getting under control now. Even with about 100 firefighters on scene from seven different jurisdictions and some help from up above, it was a task not done easily. We did have some water supply problems in that there are not fire hydrants, they're not municipal fire hydrants on this side of the uh, tracks. Uh, it's a private system that's part of the mill and uh, with the fire that system failed. What are we supposed to do? All the employees had managed to get out once the fire started, but safety concerns were still high and an initial alert called for evacuations within a mile radius of the mill. Exposures are a uh, primary concern. We we're also concerned with not knowing exactly what was burning, so we wanted to check and confirm that. That first alert was soon scaled down as crews got things under control. Now the focus shifts to what is likely to be a lengthy spot watch. With that much uh, material that has burned, um, producing the kind of heat that we're seeing generated by this fire, uh, I don't think anybody's going to be sifting through uh, the fire scene itself in the next day or so. Uh, this, this is going to be smoldering for a while. Now, no deaths were reported, but one patient was seen at McKinsey Willamette. Staff there said that their wounds were superficial, so they were not admitted. Live in Springfield, Nangwin, KEZI 9 News. Now, the chaos was compounded by a shift change when the fire was starting there. Some employees were coming some going, some were just feet from the flames as they ripped through the building. KEZI 9 News reporter Sarah Hurwitz is live from the scene as well with reaction from those who watched this all unfold. Sarah. Well, it was a frantic scene for Swanson Group employees this evening. They say that they feared for their lives and that they had to act fast. Now, we spoke with two Swanson Group employees who say that their decisions were a matter of life and death. And I heard on the radio that another uh, employee that works there said, hey, there's flames, there's uh, big flames. And next thing you know, I looked up in the rafters and it was just nothing but fire. As flames rushed towards Swanson Group employee Dwayne Hunter, he says he went to his designated emergency area, but then had to act on instinct. I could see that the flames were coming to me or towards us, and I, I tried to get everybody out of there as I could. Fast moving flames shooting feet into the air gave Hunter only seconds to react. All I was thinking about was my nine month old baby at home and my wife, and I just wanted to get out of there. It was just like a, uh, just like a firecracker just going off. You know, just uh, like golden flame just shooting across the, the top of the building and uh, we just started running. Daniel Homaker, another employee at Swanson, says that they were running for their lives, fearing a catastrophic explosion from propane. Oh, sh Jolene Proctor witnessed the fire from her front yard. We saw flames coming out of the air ducts, everything, and just the wind carrying the flames over to another building. Proctor says watching the fireball grow, she and her fiance worried about any employees who might be inside and was afraid that it might reach their home and their pets. Just being out here in disbelief, hoping that the wind didn't blow this direction. A fire that's leaving everyone emotionally drained. I'm still shaking. I'm still scared. I'm still like, I can't believe it. I mean, the flames were right there. I could feel the heat from the fire on top of me. Now, the employees did have help getting back to their cars, which they had to abandon when they evacuated. Live in Springfield, Sarah Hurwitz, KZI 9 News. We spoke with the mill COO as the fire was unfolding this evening. As soon as Chuck Wirt learned of the devastation, he began driving up from Glendale. His main concern was safety. Once he learned that everyone was okay, they started working on plans for what is next. They were calling each of the employees. The plan was to see how many of these employees they could possibly move. The company has three other plants around the state. There is a meeting scheduled with the workers on Monday to discuss those possibilities. As for if they plan to rebuild the Springfield mill there, he wouldn't comment only say that they're looking at all of their options this story couldn't be told without the overwhelming response from you the viewers you jumped into action from the moment the fire started and sent us dozens of amazing photos and video we get the best view of the fire from the air clinton reynolds sent in this video taken from a helicopter passing through the area of the fire you get a good sense of just how massive this fire was spread out across most of the mill Cheryl Warner sent us that video. You can hear two men talking about the fire. Stephen Allais gets us a bit closer to the scene from the ground, and Ivan Neri Garcia captures a huge fireball in black smoke. 
Whoa! Did you get that? Tony Talbot and his friend cannot contain themselves as they watch a huge burst of fire shooting into the sky from their vantage point. Massive flames. Here's where my kids are at. And Trish Clark Doty gives us the view from the Willamette Lane Center about 445 as a worried mother waits for her kids to come out so they can leave. Many amazing photos of the fire as well. Take a look at Dan V's photo from Twitter. He was inside an Amtrak train passing the mill as those flames were raging. Carl Skeel was right at the scene and sent us these great shots of the flames and smoke in the area. And viewers from miles away could see the smoke as well. Randy Katterma sent us this scene just south of Cottage Grove where the smoke plume was highly visible. And a good view as well from Skinner Butte. Lauren Farnsworth sent us this photo. Here's another from Jason Hood. Erica Stambaugh Bailey snapped this shot as she was sitting in the stands at PK Park. And finally, Olivia Suing sent us this photo. You can see the smoke lingering as the sun shines through during her family's hike at Mount Pisgah. And again, a big thank you to everyone who sent us those images. And there are many more viewer photos that we did not show, we could not get to. Just head over to our KEZI 9 News Facebook page to check them all out for yourself. And our mill fire coverage continues online. We have tons of content at KEZI.com, both the mobile and traditional platforms. Information is also on our Facebook and Twitter pages. Feel free to join in on the discussion, share your experiences, along with some of those amazing pictures and video. Now, your first forecast with Chief Meteorologist Justin Stapleton. Yeah, I definitely want to reiterate that as well. We appreciate everyone sending in all of your information. Eyes and ears on the ground certainly are the way that we get that breaking news out to you. All right, here's what we're looking at. One of the things we were watching in the Weather Center here was what direction were the winds coming in from today for folks trying to get back into that evacuation zone. If you remember, that was about M Street down towards 26th. And they were mostly coming in from the north and northeast. One of the reasons why we got up to 90 degrees in Eugene today. We're cooling off nicely, though. That's the good news. In the low 60s, Corvallis and Eugene, 64 in Bend, mid to upper 50s at the coast. And unfortunately, Roseburg, low 90s today. That'll be your last hot day, still sitting in the mid 70s. Meanwhile, we've got other fires across the state that we haven't even touched on yet, the Waterman Complex north of Madras uh, that we were picking up on the storm tracker radar because that smoke plume is so large. Fire weather warning, basically the red flag warning is extended from this time tomorrow night. And as we jump in a little closer and put storm tracker into motion, it is going to stay all quiet for the rest of the night tonight. You can see just outside of the M there, the very beginning of the sweep, that little uh, green blip. Yep, that's the fire plume. So here's what, or the uh, smoke plume rather. 90 was our high today. It is going to cool off over the next couple and wait and to see how cool we're talking as we head in towards your Sunday forecast. I'll have that next. Two men are still unaccounted for more than 24 hours after a fire in Cresswell. It happened on Butte Road yesterday afternoon at about 3. Investigators were on scene all afternoon today looking for clues, but they still haven't been able to contact 65-year-old Dennis Kelly or 69-year-old Carl McFarland. Witnesses say it was a hectic scene. The house was just completely ablaze. And people were down there freaking out. The neighbor was telling us how he was. He went down there to unload his stuff, and then he saw smoke co coming from the house. Sheriff's office wants to hear from anyone who has seen either man or their tan and white 1982 Ford F-150 truck. Another structure fire near the in the Gateway area of Springfield burned through several sheds this afternoon. It was about 335 in the 3300 block of Pheasant Boulevard. Crews say two sheds burned. No word though yet on a cause. Wildfire season continues to pick up here in Oregon. Crews are fighting several fires burning across the state. The Moccasin Hill fire near Klamath Falls has done the most damage, destroying 17 homes and more than a dozen other structures. 2,500 acre wildfire is now 55% contained. And in central Oregon, a wildfire has closed Highway 26 near Mitchell. Level three evacuations are in place for the Waterman complex. Justin was talking about three fires started by lightning. People in the Marks Creek estates have been told to evacuate. 4,300 acres have been burned and the fires are less than 30% contained. The Wisconsin man suspected of killing a former Oak Ridge woman pleaded not guilty today. 52-year-old Stephen Zelich is accused of killing Jenny Gomez and another woman, stuffing their bodies into suitcases and then dumping them along a rural highway. While Zelich watched it through a video feed, his attorney entered not guilty pleas on two charges of hiding a corpse. 
A former police officer told investigators he met the women online and they died accidentally during bondage sessions. He is now in jail on $1 million bond. A delay in a case involving two Eugene brothers waiting to be extradited back to Oregon to face sex abuse charges. Jody and Jackie Allard were each indicted on 10 counts of encouraging child sex abuse. They are now in Colorado and are fighting extradition back to Oregon. Jackie's case has been rescheduled for a week from today. Jody's has been pushed to August 21st. Jody taught at Shasta Middle School for 16 years. Former U of O basketball player Brandon Austin won't be suiting up in Kansas for Hutchinson Community College. Staff with the athletic department say they didn't offer him a scholarship but can't discuss why. Austin was one of three Ducks dismissed from the team after he was accused of rape. Charges, though, never filed. A Rhode Island college had previously suspended Austin after a different sexual assault case. That investigation recently concluded, also with no charges. A Reedsport man is in the hospital following an officer-involved shooting. Reedsport police and the Douglas County Sheriff's Office responded to a disturbance at a mobile home park on North End Street at about 12.30 today. They say when they got there, they were confronted by an armed suspect. Shots were exchanged. Suspect was shot at least once. His condition is unknown. No officers were injured. And a second person has died after a head-on crash on Highway 126 yesterday. State police say 78-year-old Brunhild Maria Watkins of Venita was headed west when her car crossed the center line and smashed head-on with a vehicle driven by 47-year-old Kirk Rinaldi from Dorena. Watkins died at the scene. Rinaldi died early this morning. Both drivers were wearing their seat belts. Another tragedy for Malaysia Airlines more than four months after Flight 370 disappeared. Malaysian Flight 17 was shot down today near the Russian-Ukrainian border and American intelligence authorities think a surface-to-air missile is responsible. There were 298 people on board. Tonight, the Obama administration is trying to confirm who launched the strike and whether there were Americans on board. The United States will offer any assistance we can to help determine what happened and why. And as a country, our thoughts and prayers are with all the families of the passengers, wherever they call home. Vice President Joe Biden says the incident was not an accident and said the plane was blown out of the sky. While the world awaits answers to the tragedy in Ukraine, we are also paying attention to what's happening in the Middle East, Israel's offensive into the Gaza Strip. The air raids continued Friday in Gaza City as it has been confirmed that Israel has begun the ground phase of its operation. The Israeli military says its mission is to stop Hamas from conducting more rocket attacks from across its border. Today, the U.N. Secretary General pleaded for both sides to resolve the conflict. There can be no military solution to this conflict. This applies as much to Israel, Palestine, as it does to Syria. More than 240 people have been killed in the 10-day conflict between Israel and Hamas. Coming up, a local woman says she was asked to leave a local business because her service dogs weren't allowed inside. And now, more than a year later, her complaint will go before a judge. We're going to have both sides of the debate straight ahead. Watching out for you, this is KEZI 9 News at 11 with Brian Richardson and Chief Meteorologist Justin Stapleton. All right, welcome back, everyone. Here's a live shot on our Storm Tracker 9 live radar sweep. Not a lot going on out there, and in fact, it's going to stay pretty quiet, at least for the next day or so. We'll start to see some changes coming uh, as we head in towards the beginning of the end of the weekend. Basically, we're talking about the Saturday, Sunday time frame, and that'll be a chance for some showers to start. But showers, very, very light showers moving in, but they'll be there. Uh, the other thing we were watching here across the region today was, again, the winds coming out of the north and then again northeast right across where the Springfield Mill fire was. The good news is, is that obviously uh, crews able to at least get that somewhat under control you saw a second ago. Uh, we'll continue to watch for any developments that might be with that uh, weather-wise. Otherwise, it's in the low 60s. Corvallis and Eugene right now. We're at 68 in Cottage Grove. 74 still down in Roseburg, one of the spots in the 90s today. Mid-60s out and bending around 55 as you get out towards Newport. Green grass gauge for today, the amount at about to 1.30. You can do that in two waterings of uh, a little over half an inch or right about a half an inch.
inch, 0.43 for three waterings, and just a slight chance for some actual rain to fall on Sunday. We'll get into that in a second. 83 in Portland, it was 88 in the Dow, same thing in uh, Bend today. 90, or 90 the Dow, excuse me, 83 in Portland, 93 down in Roseburg. We touched 90 again today in Eugene. That'll be the last day, though, as we go through the next 24 hours on the Stormcast. You can see some of the low clouds will probably fill in early tomorrow morning. Most of it will be out at the coast, though, and then everybody, as we head into the afternoon, will be back under mostly sunny skies. And then by Saturday, we start to see everything fill back in. Now, a little bit of a stronger storm starts to move on through. Our high has actually flattened out just a bit. And so we've got these little areas of low pressure that are all kind of rolling around over top of the jet stream. Now, eventually, they'll start to gain some steam. We'll see a low drop southward out across most of Washington, but still it will be close enough to not only cool us down by Saturday and Sunday, but also give us a slight chance for a shower as well. Nice to maybe just knock some of the dust off. So we'll go overcast in the morning, mostly sunny in the afternoon for the coast. Out to the Umpqua, we're talking about 87 in Elkton, close to 88 in Roseburg, so out of the 90s, but still warm tomorrow. Sunny and cooler up in the Cascades as the temperatures will be in the mid to upper 70s. We'll be in the mid 80s out in Central Oregon. Red flag warning extends through 11 o'clock tomorrow night. And the wind's out of the northwest, so again, that is going to bring some smoke down in towards Madras, likely. And then here in the valley, we'll be looking at temperatures in the mid-80s for tomorrow, so a little cooler than today. Slight chances for the rain drizzle, basically, Sunday and into Monday, and then Tuesday, Wednesday, Thursday. Not a lot warmer, but more sunshine starting to warm up, so enjoy those low 80s Sunday and Monday in the Umpqua, because we'll be back into the upper 80s by next week. Cascades, a few light showers Sunday and Monday, and same thing here in the Willamette Valley. Brian, we go from... 90s to 80s so look at that upper oh. 70s kind of a drizzly day but i don't think anybody will mind no. on sunday it looks glorious thank you justin you bet. all right still ahead the woman who tried to bring her service dogs into eugene convenience store and the year-long battle that ensued we're going to have the latest in this developing story and why the state of oregon is leading a massive campaign against the makers of five hour energy we'll be right back watching out for you this is kzi 9 news an apparent case of discrimination in Eugene more than a year ago will soon go before a judge. A complaint says when Michelle Hilt Hayden and her husband went to the Duck Stop Market on Franklin Boulevard on April 17th of last year, they were asked to leave by the owner, owner Kara Johnson, because the dogs weren't allowed inside, even though they were service dogs. Complaint says when Hilt Hayden returned the next day with the documents about service dogs, Johnson yelled at her and then told her no again. After a fair and thorough investigation, our investigators determined that there was substantial evidence of unlawful discrimination. Kara Johnson's lawyers say, say that Duck Stop Market welcomes people with disabilities and their service animals and display a sign near its front entrance stating service animals welcome. On April 17, 2013, Duck Stop Market denied access to two dogs brought into the store by Michelle Hilt Hayden because those two dogs were not service animals as defined by state and federal law. At no time did Duck Stop Market deny Michelle Hilt Hayden access to the store, end quote. Oregon's at the head of a 33-state investigation into the makers and marketers of five-hour energy. In a lawsuit filed today, the Oregon Attorney General says the company falsely claims that customers get extra energy and focus from a unique blend of ingredients. State AG argues the effects actually comes from a concentrated dose of caffeine. Suit also targets claims that users don't experience a crash when the effects subside and the product is okay for adolescents. A five-hour energy spokesperson says the state attorney general is grasping at straws. Thousands of Microsoft workers are losing their jobs. The software giant says it will cut 18,000 jobs over the next year. That is 14% of its workforce. The first 13,000 layoffs will happen over the next six months. The company is trying to create a leaner company. Most of the layoffs will be employees Microsoft inherited when it bought Nokia. Marcus Mariota is back on the island, hanging out with fans in Honolulu, but he wasn't exempt from a barrage of football questions. Mike Scow shows you what he had to say about question marks at wide receiver. That is next in sports. Now, KEZI 9 Sports with Mike Scow. Not until this week had Marcus Mariota, household name and Hawaii native, met San Diego Charger linebacker Manti Teo, a college start Notre Dame, and fellow island native. And as humble as Marcus comes off, he considered it an honor to sit next to Manti as co-keynote speakers at Honolulu's Downtown Athletic Club gathering. 
Of course, Marcus took every kind of question, including what the loss of Braylon Addison means to the Ducks offense. The loss will hurt this season, but he touched on the same thing we've been talking about since the spring game, that stable of young talent. It's tough to kind of replace a Braylon Addison. Um, you know, he was kind of one of those guys that played multiple positions when he was on the field. Um, but with that being said, we have a bunch of young guys beneath him. I mean, Devin Allen, Chance Allen, uh, Darren Carrington, uh, Dwayne Stanford. I mean, there's, there's a whole bunch of guys um, that we're able to kind of look to, and hopefully they'll step up. Um, they had a solid spring. Their receiver core had a, lot of, had a great spring, and now um, heading to fall camp, you know, I think those guys are prepared. And with about 16 hours left until Major League Baseball's signing deadline, another former Beaver star has finalized a deal. Multi-threat junior Dylan Davis has agreed to sign with the San Francisco Giants, foregoing his senior year with the Beavers. A third-round pick in this year's draft, Davis will see a cool $650,000 signing bonus. Davis played both outfield and pitched for Oregon State this past season, leading the pack with 64 RBIs. He's expected to join the Salem Kaiser Volcanoes, the giant short season Class A affiliate and rival of the Eugene Emeralds. And speaking of the M's, no better for Eugene up north. They fall 11 to 9 at Vancouver today. One more game tomorrow before coming back home. And in West Coast League action, Corvallis drops game one to Bellingham, 4 to 2. Game two coming your way tomorrow at 7.05. So you go from Corvallis to Salem, likely to Salem. Quite a quite a distance. I, I, he could probably handle that something. I think me. so. Yeah. Thank you, Mike. Probably. All right. With ice cream, there really aren't many bad flavors, no. are there? Up next, a local creamery in search of a new flavor has whittled down your ideas to a top ten. What they are next. All right. Finally tonight, top ten finalists have been announced in the Red Wagon Creamery's Flavor Mania contests. More than 400 people submitted ideas. Now it is up to you to vote online for your favorite. Next weekend, there will be a special voting event. It starts Friday the 25th through Sunday. Every in-store voter will receive a free hot fudge, caramel, and whipped cream on of their scoop. So the choices you ask, well, check it out here. Megan Hinkle submitted coconut red curry. How about apple pie with sharp cheddar cheese? That was sent in by Rosemary Claire. Justin giving a thumbs up there. There's also Skinner's Mud Hole that is dark chocolate ice cream, a little bit of coffee swirl, some Oreos and sea salt. Sounds good. Mike Scott's got intrigued. a huge smile on I his face. I am intrigued. We also have a link on our website, kezi.com, if you would like to vote. Coconut red curry would be good, too. I would try that. That would be apple a funky, pie, funky flavor. Mix. Apple pie cheddar? Yeah. I would I would try that. That would be amazing. I think just any time you have yeah. ice cream there, yeah. it's probably advisable. To try they do well and the thing is like if you get a chance like I love just mint chocolate chip like, right just straight up and and Stuart and his team there they make the best because it's like real mint so it's not too sugary and it's just enough my kids don't really they're like dad it doesn't taste right and I was like it's cuz it tastes real <laughs> something tells me Justin really doesn't want to stray far from that mint chocolate chip and if he they want us to taste for free please <laughs> let us know. all right thank you for watching KZI 9 news at 11 we're gonna have much more on that fire in Springfield tomorrow morning on KZI 9 news good night